My name is Raphael Hayen. I'm here tonight to share some information with at Emerson College worked last summer in reproducing some costumes for theatrical productions, keeping in mind how to keep the cost down. And we did this thanks to the help of a grant from USITT. To present our findings tonight, I have my friend, colleague, and student, Abigail Gillen. How good are evening, you tonight? Rafael. Very good. Great. So one of the things I wanted to explain first, um, you heard me talk about USITT. USITT. What exactly is that? <laughs> People ask me that. Everybody yeah. knows about USITT. Well, USITT is an organization that really helps promote education, uh, new technologies, new products in the design and technology field. Uh, the, their mission is to help uh, practitioners, scholars, um, freelance designers, etc., in expanding in their career. I wanted to read from the website, USITT website. The mission is connect performing arts, design, and technology com communities to ensure a vibrant dialogue among practitioners, educators, and students. And then their vision can be summarized as a prominent leader of theater and entertainment design, management, and technology throughout conferences, exhibitions, awards, publications, and research. So this particular project was part of that research. And it was, uh, I applied for a grant, and they liked the project. So it was dedicated to the participants and the community that belongs to the Custom Commission. And um, what exactly inspired you to apply for this grant and do this project? Well, you know, you were with me in the <laughs> costume shop and being to some of my classes. And part of it is the questions that the students ask. You know, when I get my first show, if I get a very small budget, how do I reproduce mm -hmm. a historical costume? Or they say, uh, if I had to make a wedding gown, but I don't have the funds to do it. Or if I had to create like a t uh, tux jacket, but I don't have the funds or the time or the table to do it. Mm. So many times working with students for the last 18 years, uh, sometimes, you know, we come up with ideas when we think outside the box. It's, it's about going to lay the custom rack in the, you know, in a in cheap stock place. Room. Yeah, yeah. Or in a stock room or in a garment district and then seeing something and thinking, huh, if I cut this or if I add that, that could look like a period garment. So that was the idea. Absolutely. Um, and how many Emerson students uh, participated in this project? In this particular project, we have, well, we have various students because they all contribute different things like ideas, et cetera. But mm -hmm. the people who worked with me last summer specifically, there were three specific people who helped me lead the project. There was a main tailor who was Brian Joinsky, and they were first hands, including Charlotte Giussino and Jackie Rochelle. And we divided, you know, the projects into different chunks. So somebody was in charge of the major alterations for the tailoring, somebody was in charge of the finishing stitching, somebody was in charge of the drafting for the patterns. So different aspects like that. Okay. And you mentioned uh, first hand. Now, what exactly does a first hand <laughs> do? A first hand is like your right hand. You know, okay. if you are a, a draper or a tailor and you are working on the dress form, and you do some drawings, etc. That's the person that you trust with your initial work. And they can even help you pattern, a clean pattern, or they can actually take the second draft and then cut into the real fabric. Okay. They, they are as capable as a main tailor or as a main draper, uh, but they really work in tandem with you. Okay, wonderful. Um, and why did you want to share these techniques? Your tricks of the trade. I think, you know, it's one of those things, you know, we keep reinventing the wheel. So I thought, rather than reinventing the wheel, is there a way I can record some of these and begin this sort of dialogue amongst different communities? So this could be the first of a series of these different uh, videos, etc., that we could do. Um, you know, custom shops are busy places, uh, you know, with lots of supply, especially in academia, or people who are freelancers, you start, you know, creating this little room in your home with all these little buttons, etc. So you can actually produce things. So I thought, wouldn't it be great if there's one place where they, we can all go to get inspired, to look for answers, uh, that we can use visuals to actually remind us, oh, we can reproduce these things, you know. So that was the idea. Uh, so when I went to ISATT, I, my, my main thing was, can I do this uh, series of PowerPoints and maybe even a, a video where I can share some of the techniques that the students have taught me or that I found in working with them to repurpose existing garments. Um, you know, some of the things that we can see in custom shops, once you, you, you need to know the basic techniques. You need to know how to do your basic sewing. You need to know how to use an industrial machine, as you know. Mm -hmm. You need to know what are the specific sewing techniques you have to do for theater, for tear and wear. Um, you know, how, what kind of irons to use for specific things. So, for example, in, in this particular video, you can see I'm working with Brian, who is my main first hand, 
Mm -hmm. um, we're going, um, you know, over different steps of how to prep fabrics. You've been there with me. Absolutely. We to, you know, yes, I have. You know, bolting fire, etc. And in this case, we're reviewing existing patterns. Uh, we're looking at, we have reproduced some color and some lapels uh, to use uh, a modern jacket that we're transforming into a period garment. So it's stage worthy and it reads as, you know, a particular period, even though we know up close that it's not. Um, so this is one of the things, what, what I call about repurposing. And um, with Brian, you know, I would explain to him, this is a particular color shape of the period. And then Brian's job was to uh, manipulate the pattern and grade it so it fit the jacket. Because uh, we had to go from like a 46 to a 42. Um, you know, and we use different things to keep things economical. You can use brown butcher paper, which is inexpensive, mm -hmm. rather than old tag, like you would do in the Absolutely, fashion industry, right. to make patterns, you know, mm -hmm. so that kind of thing. So, and here, uh, we're looking at our prototypes that we're going to use to create these lapels. Um, in this case, we're focusing on one jacket, but you could make a series of them. Uh, we use uh, an existing cutaway or like a tux uh, existing, you know, we got them for 25 bucks and uh, it was a wool poly blend. and. Uh, there were some existing seams that we could cut into to then reshape the jacket. Um, so here I'm working with Brian. You can see in there we're looking at the dress form. We're assessing what do we need to do. To, right. You know, and you know from your experience. Absolutely. Your best and friends are the dress forms, yes. Right, exactly. And it takes several tri tries to yes. and get And many it different right. steps. So here we, we based it basically where the new folding line was going to be and we're hiding the collar. And then uh, you're, you're familiar with the cross stitch, one of the many stitches right, that we yes. used. The best stitch ever. <laughs> <laughs> so in this case, it's not for a hem or for a stretch fabric, it's actually to hold down a lapel. Uh, so Brian here is getting the stitching technique ready. Um, he's a very meticulous tailor, which is something as a first hand that you want to trust. Um, he's almost as meticulous as you are. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I think he's more meticulous than I am. But <laughs> so uh, here he's ready to demonstrate, you know, what, because we're folding the lapel, which is, um, you know, so it doesn't roll out, uh -huh. but we're not cutting it because the idea is to be able to then put the jacket back to the original after we use it for this particular production. Oh, okay. So. Um, Two you know, and one. <laughs> that's right. Uh, so, so it's not just, so here he's beginning to show us this particular technique uh, of the cross stitch. Um, it, it keeps it down, but it gives it flexibility, which is important. So it doesn't rip from the outside of the right. jacket. And especially with an actor. I mean, you have to have that mobility. And that's right. That's right. Because you're going to wear it for like 30 days in a production every night. So the wear and tear is pretty intense. So it, it, strong stitches, but flexible okay. in this case. Um, so that was the, one of the steps in hiding the old color, you know, like if I took this and then creating a new shape and then putting the new one on top. Um, and, and here we see how Brian and I are talking and discussing, like, how do we put the new lapels on? Uh, how do we attach the new color on? Making everything look finished. We also want the actor to feel comfortable. Uh, I mean, sometimes, you know, it's a quick change. The actors are doing their job. They're not concerned about what's happening in the inside. But for this particular character, it was very important that he felt really at home with his jacket. Okay. And so I know from firsthand experience that um, there are a lot of uh, student designers that will be doing their, designing their first show. Right. And there are a lot of challenges. And um, what are some of those challenges? That well, I think that the, the biggest challenge when you're starting out is, you know, you get a show that has maybe a large number of customs and you realize the budgets are really small and the timetable can be quite fast. You may have three to five weeks to produce something. Usually it's three weeks. And um, so it's thinking outside the box, having your research ready, really being prepared to look at things and think, what can I do to this to be able to transform it? Being able to have a conversation with the director so that you both can agree we can have something that is stage worthy, even though it may not be exact historical reproduction because we simply cannot afford it. Um, so, so those are some of the things. But being, really being able to redesign something. We see so many shows today in fashion and, uh, and, and in interior design. It's about repurposing things. Um, I, I think it's interesting. People think that you can go and just borrow something that mm -hmm. is already done. That's not how it works. You can borrow something that you had to add to it. You had to redesign it most of the time. Or sometimes, you know, if you had 20 toxes in one show, you may be able to borrow the shirts because that's right. a standard. But then if the toxes have a certain look, Different. let's say a chorus line, right? Absolutely. Then yeah. it's, you know, trims. So that's the redesign. So where do you save the money? Where do you put the labor? You know, what's the compromise? 
Um, I think one great sample is a, a red coat that we did. It was a British red coat from the late 1700s. Mm -hmm. And you've seen that jacket. Absolutely. You know? uh, we'll see it later. I, that's <laughs> right. And uh, I'll tell you a secret later how we came up with that idea because most okay. people that see it don't realize what it used to be before it became this. Oh, dear. I, <laughs> no sure, you can't wait. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, but it's again, and then you pick and choose what are some of the important details for that garment. Okay. Oh, let's see. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, do you sort of you? I take it that you, as that your as their teacher, you sort of guide them along the process. Right. It's not like they're completely out on their own. Right. It's, right. Okay. It's, um, the, it's the same. I guess it's the same as you as an actress. You learn different things like improvisational techniques, uh, uh, vocabulary, like what's a reveal. Uh, we have parallel things happening in design, especially in costumes, because we work. They, they, we are your best friend with the, you know the collaboration between the actor and us is the best. So um, one of the things is you know do your research, um, you know do your sketches, agree with the director what's the thing that makes sense financially, time-wise, etc., and then you know move on. Okay. So. We're going to be going to the PowerPoint next, I think. Okay. Is that correct? So we're going to be showing some teaching techniques about PowerPoint. And uh, oh. uh, you first uh, presented this at the USITT At USITT. Conference? That was uh, I, the PowerPoint that we're going to see, we first presented at USITT. And um, the, the reason was one of the, the agreements that I had with the grant was to be able to actually present this at the, uh, we have a yearly conference. This is so. a point turner. Um, it's got us, it's bamboo, so it's soft enough to not push through the fabric. And here it's just got a small point which helps us push sharp corners into our bagged out pieces. So I'm going to put it right on the corner. And the point turner is going to help us push out the corner. And you see how nice and sharp the corner of that facing is. And by pre-ironing the seam allowance open, you can get a real sharp and clean edge, which also contributes to getting a really nice folding line with the perfect point. So Brian, why did you choose the domestic iron today instead of the industrial iron? Um, I chose to use the domestic iron because this is probably polyester or some other synthetic fiber and we don't want it to melt under the extreme heat of the industrial iron. So the next thing we wanted to talk about, I wanted to show you the PowerPoint that we presented at the USITT uh, conference. We okay. have a yearly conference where we present some things. Okay. And I wonder if you can help me actually read some of the information that we gathered for that. Absolutely. Um, so the proposal for the USITT grant uh, started as an idea prompted by the questions um, from the design tech students at Emerson College. Correct. Uh, whenever they work on period shows, they have asked, how can I create period garments when money, time, and labor are very limited? Correct. And uh, how do we choose appropriate tailoring techniques for the costumes that are to be redesigned? Right, right. Uh, with the help of this grant, uh, we can create tailoring demonstrations um, with uh, consider, uh, working on the budget time and being labor conscious. Right. That can be shared with the students, professionals, and the academics of the theater. That's right. that, that was the intent. Like, can we come up with something where you can achieve the, the goals that are technical, labor, time, budget conscious, and still get a design on the stage that was stage worthy. Absolutely. And so another question came up, how can we create period garments when the money, time, and labor are limited? Right, right. And uh, the answer that I, you've told to me uh, and that you've found through the years yeah is that if you want the costumes cheap, fast, and pretty, you can only pick two out of the three. That's right. Um, in other words, you can have the fast and pretty, but it won't be cheap, right. or uh, you can have the fast and cheap, but it won't be pretty, and that's so right. on. That's right. Now, th that's a common conversation, I think, in every costume shop across the country. What happens sometimes as a designer, 
I also won the three. So in that sense, it's that, that becomes my nemesis. Uh, we usually <laughs> face the director who's asking that, but sometimes I won that. So part of my thing was, well, because I'm a costume director at Emerson College, is, is there a way to devise something where I can have the three as long as I can agree with the director that that's where we're going? So that's where this sort of idea came about, repurposing things to save money. Okay. And for the second question, how uh, do we choose appropriate tailoring techniques for the costume that are redesigned? The crew at Emerson College, the students there, um, have focused on various samples of tailoring manipulation. That's right. uh, we wanted to show various innovative approaches for producing costumes right. on a very small budget, as you said, um, but still using effective techniques that's and right. the available resources. That, that's the important thing. So I guess what I want to mention is that it takes a certain level of sophistication to be able to put the technology in place because you need to know a little bit about tailoring, a little, some good basis of stitching, um, you know, different, what different supplies sometimes you can use to achieve certain effects. So you need to have foundation to do it. It's not something you can improvise. Okay. It's either experience or education that can lead you there uh, and be able to repurpose, so. And you also drew inspiration from one of your colleagues' uh, upcoming books, yes. uh, Pravina Shukla's costume, Elective Identities Through Dress. Great. And yes. um, just to read a little bit about that, um, and uh, I think we will be moving on to the next uh, sort of, but just very, um, and uh, she was focusing on how you communicate the cohesion of the personality right. and the culture. And, and, the, and her feedback to me was part of this PowerPoint that we're presenting next. Um, and, and it's sort of like what's well, going to lead us into what we're saying in this coming up part of the PowerPoint. And I thought that her feedback was important to us. So maybe if you want to share a few of the for beginning lines. It's from a book that is coming up that she's about to publish. But I think the intro is one thing that really uh, translates to what we do. Okay. Um, students of dress understand how clothing reveals much about an individual's values and aesthetics, communicating the cohesion of personality and culture. Right. Uh, by contrast, costumes are often defined as special garments that, unlike everyday attire, aid a person in assuming the identity of the other. That's right. Um, theorized in terms of the carnivalesque, as elaborated by Botkin, uh, costumes on stage are seen as disguises used to hide the true self of the actor, as mediums for contemporary liberation from the right. confines of permanent identity. Right. So, so it's all about dress codes, really. I mean, you know, as an actor, that you know, if you need to portray a certain socioeconomic or, or a status, right. you know, the costume is going to help you lead that. Yeah, it's sort of my first point of departure after I have rehearsed and can do all I can do physically, right. and now then you just Then you need to help. know what is this, you know, because we endow the character with those Absolutely. information. And then the collaboration between me and the actor is about, okay, can you do your theater business with what <laughs> I'm giving you as a garment? So let's move to the okay. next one and see what we have. Okay, so great. we will start with um, the first sample, which is a 1700s British military red yes, coat. Yes, that's right. Um, <laughs> this is for a, a show that we did at the Public Theater in 2005, and the show Stop Stoppers Arcadia. It won, a, um, I believe, an Elliot Norton Award. Uh, for, as best production. And, uh, and this is where the director and I had this conversation about how important this red coat was. So primary research was key. And you can see on the next slide some of the things that we found. Okay. Um, so you found out the standard British Army uniform during the Napoleonic Wars for the majority of the regiments right. uh, throughout the period was the traditional red coat. Right. Uh, there was no standard supply for the uniforms and it was generally left to the regimental Colonel to contract for and obtain the uniforms for his men, right. which allowed for some regimental variation. So once we found that piece of information, <laughs> we felt like, okay, so that means it wasn't like a specific, I mean, first we agreed we were not doing a historical reproduction because mm -hmm. we simply could not afford it. But then having found this information about the fact that it wasn't a regimented coat, we thought, okay, let's oh, look at research, you know? <laughs> so we got images from museums, photographs of actual garments, historical reproductions, and then paintings, and we thought, what are the key elements that seem to show in most of the paintings? And that's what took us to the next step. Absolutely. 
Now, this is where I was saying about thinking outside the box. Because the challenge was we didn't have five, we didn't have actual things that we had like twenty-five dollars. And he's like, how do we make this tailor cut? You know, I'm a tailor, so I know how much it may cost. And also time wise, well do we have we don't have the table time or the et cetera to really you know, put as many hours. But can we still create a stage a sign that is stage worthy given the limitations? And I went, you know, I have a series of things that I collect. I collect garments all the time because I'm a custom designer. And I had this 80s red pantsuits, like a size 24, oh, right. in crepe, you know, and I, and I looked at them and I thought, huh, red, you know, that could become a coat. So <laughs> we went to, uh, so if you see in the next slide, this is what I saw. When I looked at the, uh, at the, at the pantsuit, I thought a coat that I could cut, a pair of pants that I could cut, join them at the waist seam, and then I had this shell or this shape that I could work from. So it was saving me, uh, and it had the shoulder length that I needed for the actor. Uh -huh. So I would have to, like, you know, measure the waist, uh, fit the waist, and, and then make some changes. So it would look like the research that we found. But that, that's what I think about looking outside the box. So it was the red fabric, it was crepe, it was going to breathe okay during the summer because the theater in the outdoors during the summertime, which are really hot. So, so that's where it began to work. Like, this is what we're going to do. So we put that shell together, and then you can see on the next slide what, how we came up with that. So oh. you can see in here, is a shell, so it almost looked like a cutaway, this round shape, and then that's what we brought to the fitting, and that's what we marked, you know, on the actor. The actor would have never known. <laughs> that's right. Know? So <laughs> for them, it was oh, it's this shell. So great, we're gonna go from here, and and I don't always share all my secrets because I don't think it's fair to the actor. Some actors may feel a little funny about what I'm right. doing. Oh, I'm. Waiting. I want to feel privileged yeah, as an actor. That's right. <laughs> that's right. It takes some work because it's really about the the thinking part of it and and trying to figure out how do I get there saving time and money, et cetera. So we brought this show and then we, on the actor, marked the important lines, the parameters. As you can see, some of the thread marking you can see there in the white okay, is what yeah, it yes. gives us the lines that we needed. And then some of the supplies, you know, we have like remnants of lining, like a half a yard of white lining that we could use. Uh, we have cording that we bought secondhand, inexpensive. Uh, and it was a little dingy, but it was great for us because the fact that it was aged and it was dark, it was right. pure. It's, it was already like distressed. And then we bought some trim in the uh, marine surplus uh, in Provincetown. We bought this jar, 20 jars of this trim that looked like the British trim. It was for like two dollars. <laughs> I mean, it, it's a rough find. And we a bag of silver buttons that then we use sharpie to darken them. Making it's really about thinking about that. How do we make this work with the amount what of money that we have? Mm -hmm. And then oh, here, and there it is, see? the public's production. Right. And then you see what it looked like on the stage. The idea was that this character had outgrown the jacket. He wore it maybe <laughs> when he was in his 20s, now he was in his 40s, he was still wearing it. So it was just a little tight on him, <laughs> um, you know, or a little short, uh, and it was old. So, and you can see on the dress form, you can see how nice it looked before we distressed it. And that it had the basics, it had the, the repetitive horizontal lines with the trim, it had the wonderful white detail and the buttons in the back, and that's what we're trying to emulate. So somebody could see and say, oh, that's a red coat from the Napoleonic Wars. Mm -hmm. And we are going on to the second example yes. we have, which is um, an 1809 tailcoat from Tom Stoppard's Arcadia same as show. well, the same <laughs> show, um, which was a modern dress coat. Um, and it's, uh, it, it was an evolution of the coat that once uh, was used for both day and evening right. dress. Right. Um, it came from, became increasingly popular from around the late 1790s and was particularly widespread through the British, Re British Regency, excuse right. me. In uh, the Regency period, the dress coat was always worn with non-matching bridges. That's right. So that was a great thing because we, by knowing that it didn't have to match, then we could use some pants that we had pulled. And then the other piece of it was, okay, so we had some cutaways that were um, either donated or they were inexpensive, the poly um, blend, wool blend. They were light, like a light gabardine, so I thought perfect for the summer. And there were some existing seams that we could open and then fold things in. That's the jacket that we saw Brian doing, the cross stitch mm, So okay. it was about can we then shape the shell and add something to it? to then make it look like a, you know, a Regency, tel what we would call today a telco. So here you can see the cutaway mark, again, thread mark, we fit it on the actor and then thread mark it to, to find exactly what the lines are that fit right on the body of the actor. We're saving time, we don't have to tailor the shoulders, we don't have to tailor the chest, we don't have to tailor the back, because we already have this wonderful shell. We're just redoing the front. So you're cutting like two thirds of the labor right you there. You never know. Okay. 
Oh, and here you can see the very important uh, that's right. cross stitch, the cross stitch <laughs> and, the, and, the, uh, and then you can also see then how the new color is going to be applied and we use a contrast fire so we could really see it because it was something that was trying like the high color mm -hmm. and later on with our model we'll see what it looks like on a person uh, and then there were some there were some things that we did that were not period like the buttons that we chose the research suggested a large button maybe three or, or four, you know. Uh, but the director and I thought this was such a fastidious character, so exacting and so, mm -hmm. that we thought, let's give him really small fruit. buttons and put <laughs> a lot of them. Uh, so uh, it's a comedy, so there's comedic aspects. So I thought th this is some, you know, liberties you can take when you're doing a theatrical Absolutely. production. Absolutely. <laughs> I would love to see that character. This is all the detail. We had choices about how to do the color, that the, the mock color that we put on top that was pretty large. Uh, you know, you can use either, either like a real tailoring technique and doing all your hand based in tailoring stitches, or you can use fusible. So, we did two samples just to show that, you know, it depends again, this is, even in the small details, you can make time saving, money saving choices. Okay, and here we have yeah. the actual <laughs> in action. That's Picture right. And we can see what it looked like in the dress form and then how it was worn on the, on the stage. Uh, again, the public theater is outdoors theater. So it's important that the five edges have the right texture, so it will pick the daylight with the, you know, the side lighting, etc. that the line designer was using. So the fact that this was a, a polyblend gabardine fabric that was lightweight was great because it just had enough sheen to it that you can capture the detail. Otherwise, it could kind of vanish or disappear, you know, right. in this beautiful Definitely greenery around. Definitely not see it on the stage. That's right. And now the third one. <laughs> is the frock coat, the famous frock <laughs> the coat. The famous frock coat. <laughs> so we went from all these jackets that were actually cutting away pieces, unfolding them and hiding them, to a jacket that we're not cutting anything, we're actually adding detail to make it look like it was cut differently. Okay. So it's altering without cutting anything. And the graphic in this slide shows you like what the, what the, line, the, mm -hmm. the lines that suggest what we have been doing up till now, and then the new coat, which is this very boxy coat. Okay, and just a little bit of history yes. before we get further in. Um, the frock coat uh, uh, emerged around 1816, and they were probably originally of military origin, mm -hmm. worn buttoned to the neck with the standing Prussian military <laughs> collar. They were worn as informal wear during the early decades of the 19th century and became increasingly popular from the 1830s That's onwards. Right. And um, a frock coat coat is characterized by knee-length skirts all around the base. Right. The frock coat is fitted, long-sleeved coat with a center vent at the back and some features un unusual in post-Victorian dress. Right. These include the reverse collar and lapels where the outer edge of the lapel is cut from a separate piece of cloth That's to right. the main body and also a high degree of waist suppression right. where the coat's <laughs> diameter um, around the waist is much less than uh, round the chest. This was achieved by a high horizontal waist seam with side uh, bodies, which are extra panels of fabric above the waist used to pull in the naturally cylindrical drape. Right. So now we're looking, we're going, we're looking at a shape that is more current with what we have today, like what would be a junior cut of a standard suit jacket. Um, so we knew, knowing that, we could use a standard suit jacket today, and then add some seams or do some alterations that can add the, the tailoring visuals that suggest there is a period coat. We're not cutting anything. We're actually taking in and creating fake darts and fake seams. Uh, and what, what you need is a jacket that is, you would buy a jacket that is maybe one size bigger or that is a different cut, not a junior coat but a fuller coat, uh, cut. So you can actually then tailor to the actor's waist. And so then, uh, when you were done with that show and you needed it for some another individual, yes. you can just take away all <laughs> of that. That's right. And That's right. <laughs> Had to watch that the stitches on the too small so you can pick them yeah. up. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I've been there. I've picked out the small stitches. <laughs> okay. So and here so. we can see some steps. For example, this is, we did different variations depending on the show. But in this one, we were in Ola. This was another production of the Public Theater this last summer. Uh, it was a production of the Seagull, and one of the characters needed this summer linen frock coat. Now, 
another thing we find in the research is that sometimes there was what they call the shorter frog, sh uh, frog coat. It's funny, you can find the research that supports what you're looking for, you know? So it was, we, we just had a really good dramaturg co collaboration where we found all this information. So we could make choices that we felt confident about. Um, I always want to back my choices with something, you know? I don't want to be a capricious designer. I want to know where it's come from and then stylize Absolutely. from there. So this is what we did here. We created the fiddleback seams that the jacket didn't have. And then we had to create that, and then by doing that, we created some fake inverted pleats to suggest those side panels that the research talks about. But also then we had to create a horizontal non-existent seam that could be read on the stage, so it would suggest front coat. Uh, so some of the things you see in this slide are the different steps, like how we thread mark the, the, the fiddleback lines, mm -hmm. how we created that waist seam, and then how we created the pleats in the back. And then you can see another variation. These are other variations. This is another variation where we added another button, so we can have four to three buttons. We can take a two-button jacket to a three-button. Uh, this is with the waist seam, and then we added some back detail. Uh, in one of the shows that we did for Little Women uh -huh. at Emerson College this past fall, we actually to, we wanted the, the actor to look a certain way, so I got rid of some of the detail. To, for our young audiences to make it a little bit more modern and palatable that way. Excellent. So we wanted to really show his ample shoulders, and this is a romantic scene, so it was like the romantics, almost, almost like the Disney you know, romantic character. So in that way, we got rid of some of the detail just to create a nice wide shoulder, narrow waist. So you can veer away from some of the historical yeah. and just yeah. for the I, audience. I think, yeah, I mean, designers may disagree on this, but I think sometimes you take some design liberties because you're trying to communicate something visually to the audience Absolutely. and you want to create this sort of fantasy. Mm -hmm. So you have to know your audience and, and then have an agreement with the director about, well, this is the step we're going to take. So we just create a very clean back and a small detail. Um, uh, but you can see here the front had the frog coat seams and then we got rid of them. But this is just a variation. I wanted to suggest these variations you can, you can include and you can get rid of. So this is one sample of that. Okay. And then this is in the show what it looked like. This is another variation you can see on the right side that has the inverted pleats and we added buttons to really emphasize that. And then you can see on the stage in one of the scenes they're interacting. It's funny because sometimes you don't see the detail as an audience member, but then there'll be a scene where there's a moment where the light hits it or something happens yes. where you feel, okay, this takes me to this period. It's not the jacket that I have in my closet. This is something else that maybe is vintage. Uh, or you may decide, wow, they should be in fashion again because I really <laughs> like it. You know? But it's that idea. It's subtle. It's not the focus. It's subtle, but it's there so when you're looking for it, yeah. it shows. It'll lay it in just the right spot. That's right. Okay, and a fourth example is a Norfolk jacket for right. the character of the father in Noel Coward's Hay Fever. Yes. And uh, the Norfolk jacket, uh, we have borrowed, uh, we borrowed an item that would have to be returned to its original shape after the show. Right. Um, and w it, uh, the Norfolk coat uh, first became popular with men and women in the 1880s, right. and it replaced the earlier patrol jacket, which was hip length and single breasted, um, and fastened with a small or Prussian collar worn with matching tight breeches for cycling during That's right. in the 1870s. It was an interesting piece of finding that we got, which was it was used for hunting, and it had a series of pleats and folds under the arm to allow the freedom of movement to carry a rifle, etc. Uh, and then it became a leisure item that was wore for sports purposes, for cycling, etc. So uh, hay fever is in the 20s, so we're in the latter part of the history of the Norfolk jacket. So we wanted this particular character to have this Norfolk jacket to to suggest a man of leisure. Even though he was a scholar and a professor, when they were in this particular house that they lived in, and if you know the show, everybody has a little age, a little, you know, cookiness mm -hmm. to them. So we thought that's his background. This is leisure. This Norfolk jacket is about class, but it's also about his man of leisure. Uh, but then there was another piece to it that we can see in the next line. Okay. Oh, so uh, this Harold copying picture comes from the 1900 book edition of the Priority School 
Priory School, <laughs> uh, the tweed Norfolk suit with belted high button neem jacket, baggy knickerbockers, long woolen stockings, <laughs> lace up boots, and stiffly starched Eton collar was a popular <laughs> everyday outfit for younger boys. So we thought maybe this is the history of this character. Maybe he was a young, young boy. boy. He had one of these jackets. So it's not only like a mm -hmm. leisure jacket that defines Tyler, but it's also wanting to be young again. Yeah, yeah, wanted to be young or childlike or bratty or he hadn't really grown up. So <laughs> we wanted to really because the, the comedy is so interesting and sort of unveiling in some places and this in other places that I thought Let's put an ambivalent coat on this guy. So we suggest one thing, but we don't know if that's where he's at. Okay. <laughs> and then we can see here different steps. Um, I've highlighted in the in the slide some of the things that we added. So we added uh, we use a matching fabric, and we added the waist detail, the pleats on the princess line in the front and the back. Uh, we changed the buttons, you know, and we saved the old ones so we can put them back on. Sometimes you borrow garments from other sources, other theater houses, etc., and then you redesign them. But then the problem is different because you cannot cut anything. Cut anything. You can alter them to look a certain way, but then you have to put them back to the arena to return them. Uh, so this is what this particular challenge is for. So in the next slide, we can see another detail. So here we can see more detail about how the buttons work. We actually, um, Brian and I looked at some research and then we saw how this waistband worked. That was part of the closure, but then it closed into itself when it was open. So we thought it was really neat to have. To give actor, you know, the actor some business to do on the oh, stage. Oh, absolutely. We love business. Yes. Right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's what we did. Uh, another thing that, another step that could happen here, we wanted to emphasize the added detail would be to add like a top stitching and a contrasting color. And then you can see the scene in context. You know, it's all 20s, it's fun. And there he is in this light summery jacket. And, and again, it's the same thing when the light hit it a certain way, you can see the detail. When it didn't, you just saw this wonderful tableau with all these light colors mm -hmm. suggesting this wonderful summer. Hay fever. Hay fever. <laughs> so, so in conclusion, one of the things that we can talk about and then we can continue to have the conversation is, you know, um, we wanted to make sure that we show options of how to show a stage-worthy costume, a stage-worthy outcome, that we then define some of the problems that ties to one of your questions about my advice to young designers. For example, you know, if you're borrowing a costume, how do you alter it? Mm -hmm. So you have to add on so you can remove. If you are using an existing jacket that is cut a certain way that is reminiscent of a period from the past, you can take in, you can fold, you can pleat, but you don't have to cut. And then if you are taking something on temporary and then making it look really like, you know, centuries apart, then you have to cut. But you don't have yeah. to get rid of the arena garment. You can fold, you can cross stitch, you can hide, you can superimpose another layer to make it look like the period. So you can always take it back to the arena and then repurpose it once again. It's all about recycling, it's all about repurposing, it's all about redesigning. Uh, you know, we talk about being green nowadays. Exactly, perfect That's for what we're staining. doing, it's, yes. a, it's a triple win. You know, <laughs> time, money, and, and beautiful. Yes. You know, triple win in this case. So, so that's what this was about for us. Wonderful. Oh, uh, let's see. Um, uh, so, in the last paragraph, I think summarize on. the. Uh, uh, yes, uh, with the help of the U USITT grant, students from Emerson College uh, and Raphael Hein <laughs> addressed the idea of redesigning these costumes. And uh, we can economize in materials and labor by repurposing existing garments. We come up with solutions by thinking outside the box and seeing possibilities in every piece of clothing we procure, procure, procure for a show. Excuse me. Instead of recreating ex, uh, exacting historical right. garments, right. we choose to emulate the most important details of the stage scale for the stage scale. We dress characters with stage-worthy garments while saving money for theaters and for schools, recycling and repurposing. repurposing. It's a green win-win-win. <laughs> I like that. A friend of mine from New York gave me that quote, and I thought, I'm going to use it. It, it sounds really good. It sounds yeah. contemporary. It sounds Sold, today. Sold, done. That's right. Grant. <laughs> you know, now, one of the things that uh, you asked me earlier about, you know, in the design process for the young designer, I think one of the things I was hoping to convey with this presentation was that research is important because the research, primary, secondary, tertiary, uh, dramaturgical, you know, it's really important to find the data that can support the choices that you had to make when you cannot reproduce a historical garment. We're just trying to emulate something or create an impression of something that can 
you know, guide the audience so they know what they're looking at, what period is. Uh, you know, in the design world, you can do all kinds of things. You can, if you're doing a musical, a Disney musical, then you have the Disney touch. You know, if you're doing something that is uh, macabre, then you have the Gothic touch. If you're doing something that is uh, you in town, then you yeah. have the Bactrian touch. So it's like, what does that mean? What is the texture? So as a designer, you create a visual vocabulary that is going to help tell the story to the audience. So you can abstract, you can stylize, mm -hmm. but you have to have that research. Uh, and, and in repurposing, it's really important to have that because it can give you clues as to what then is the important choice to make to deliver something stage worthy. Uh, so you may have 20 choices and you only pick the three important ones, given you know the budget, etc. Uh, but you still can have something that is, is communicating on the stage the story you want to tell. So I think that's one of the things for the for the designers process wise to know to do the research, do the sketching process with the cuts that you're making in mind. Um, I always say, don't share all the secrets. You know, I didn't tell my director that I bought a, you know, that I had a crepe 80s suit pan because they couldn't picture that. They would say like, oh, that'd be wrong for the actor. I wouldn't right. wear it. Where I saw them like, this is what we were able to do with $25. And they were like, that's so fantastic. So um, now, you know, one thing we want to look at pretty soon is uh, uh, I, um, what these garments look like on a person. Okay. You know what I mean? Um, now, one other thing, again, and as a designer, you do the sketching, and then you have to know your actor proportions. I always say to my students, you know, get the, see if you can get the basic measurements first, and ask the director, you know, who, if he hasn't cast, find out are they type casting, mm -hmm. or, or are they casting a voice so the person may look differently. But you need to have that research. You need to have your, your dramaturgical research with images to talk to the director, what world are we creating? Is it impressionistic? Is it modernistic? What is it? You do your sketches. If you have the actor information, you sketch based on the actor information. Okay. So you typically would sketch after the show is cast? Ideally, or? yes. Okay. Sometimes you can't. So uh, like sometimes like in film, you can because the, the talent may not be ready yet mm -hmm. or they're trying to contract them, so you, you, you're the lines before that. Sometimes you may have half of your cast. Sometimes, you know, uh, you know, around in Boston, if you're doing a show that opens the season in the fall, you probably have the cast in the summer, so you can actually get their pictures and then draw the person in proportion so that you, you can see what you're going to deliver. You know, because it would be really hard to say, oh, I'm designing for this particular person, then the cast is different, or the actor, right? You know, you know that if you're Absolutely. at a fitting and you see a sketch that doesn't look mm -hmm. like you, you may say, wait a minute, mm -hmm. uh, doesn't mm -hmm. feel right. So it's all about the visual. Okay. And soon we will be introducing our model, uh, Tyler Kinney, will that be soon, or are we? Getting yes, it? He's, he's getting ready, okay. so we're going to okay. be presenting yes. pretty soon. Okay. And uh, so, um, one of the things I wanted to mention is while Tyler gets ready, is that because um, I work with you, you have been I dress you a few yes. times, I design for you, and yes. we have great time. Uh, but one of the things I find interesting is when we share like what your motivations are or what the character is doing in mm -hmm. a particular scene, and then when you come to the fitting, how you are able to integrate that. Absolutely. The, uh, the costume is key because, I don't know, a lot of, I was just in, you just designed Little Women, I played Amy in right. that, mm -hmm. and we had all of these big petticoats and hoop skirts, <laughs> and I know for me, we, um, it just, I don't know, was a very key part of my right. character because I was this young spitfire <laughs> little girl and dealing with all of this muss of petticoat and um, which really informed my informed my character right, and right. further um, I don't know it made me upset and just That's irritated right. well and in many ways I thought I was giving you an obstacle yes right, the absolute obstacle, obstacle is the word and yes. you had to you know you had your corset you have I mean that's why we wanted to send to rehearsal early. That's another key thing, you know, can you send to rehearsal early enough for the actor to integrate it? Uh, and that's some negotiating, you know, because sometimes wardrobe is not ready to be there right. at that point. But it's so really about... So you just about, have stand-ins, yeah, rehearsal... Rehearsal clothing. clothing. But I think in this case was, uh, can I give you the actual garment so you can work the obstacle as part of your character? Yes. Because I, I feel as a designer, that's part of her need to break free is that she's so bound by this particular dress code of so the period and she wants to be something that she wants to be her. So that was interesting the thing is to see how you were, you were adapting into but you were wrestling with it and then you owned it and, and it was such a fire you know 
charge performance, <laughs> right? So I think that's important for all the actors when we're making some choices custom-wise, that the actor is part of a conversation at a level where Absolutely. we understand your language. And you know, if I tell yes. you it's a custom, it's an obstacle, you know, or if, oh, there's going to be a reveal, then you know, oh, so I'm taking this off so I can show this other side of me. And it's really just key to start that dialogue early on because I've seen some situations, I've been in them myself where I've been just completely in the dark about what I will be wearing right. and we get into the first week of dress rehearsal or tech rehearsal and I absolutely, all of my lines go out the window right. because I'm just worried about <laughs> what I have on or if it's too tight or so on and so forth that's and right. that's the last thing you need to worry about. Well, but one thing we can look at is how our model is going to deal with the obstacle of the next few items that we're going to have in dress, correct? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we have Tyler Kenny, uh, correct? Tyler Kenny, um, who is a 2010 BFA design tech student right, at Emerson, Emerson College. College. And the first garment Tyler will be modeling is um, a late 1700s British red coat That's that right. you saw earlier in the PowerPoint. And you can see here, then up close the detail, how it fits. Luckily, Tyler is pretty close to the size of the actor that we have, so he can model this. Uh, but you can see some of the detail, like in the front, the, the choice of trim, just to give it that look from afar on the stage that had that, the, the horizontal lines that all these red coats have. Mm -hmm. And also the silver buttons that look stained and old. You can see the shoulder de detail, the epaulets, which we created from, from scratch. But they needed to look worn, like they were maybe 20 years old, so they weren't all together there. So we created some, and we took some out so it doesn't look full. Uh, and then the back detail, I think, is really important. The, we create this sort of fiddle back. Uh, we gave, if, if the actor crosses his arms, uh, you can see we added an extra bend just for ease. Because again, there's because theater, it's it's to... stage business, so it's not like in real life. But then also in the bottom, you can see how the pants Oh, those the are tails. the pant legs. That's okay. right. <laughs> and then how we use the lining remnants to create the illusion of this sort of wonderful white little detail. Oh, okay. um, and then again, the silver buttons. For the silver buttons to age, then we just use Sharpies. Um, so, so this is the red coat. Next, we're going to be seeing the, the gray frog coat. Now, another thing about this red coat, I don't, think if, I don't know if I mentioned it, is that uh, you know, it had to last about 30 performances. Mm. It had to be really uh, summer. Um, uh, Summer weight. <laughs> that's right. Uh, you know, it was going to be dry clean every so often according to the equity rules, you know, in, in the theater. Um, so, and then we had to create like a little kit of things that, that we had extra buttons that we sharpie, you know. I, I bought like a bag of Boston buttons, so there was a lot of there. And then we, we gave them extra things in case there needed to be some repair um, with some instructions. So, so mm -hmm. the other thing you have to think as a designer is how is he, does he get maintained? when you're not there. Right. Uh, what Especially do you give? for a long, long run. A long run, you know, because for a week it's different. And then the other issue was how do we um, have, um, uh, what do we give the word of the department to be able to maintain while I'm away? So the next code is the... Early 1800s tail coat. That's right. So here we can see how we cut this. Uh, specifically, they were shorter, so we made it a little longer. Basically, the seam where the, the drop ways that you've seen, uh -huh. that's an existing seam in the cutaway. So with this, we opened the seam and then we folded the front panel back into the jacket so we didn't cut it. Oh. So we can put it back to the known. original. Uh -huh. And then we fold the all lapels all inside. So if Tyler showed you the inside of the jacket, you can see the, the, how clean the lining is. Uh, because we cover all this, all the business that is hidden inside is covered with this wonderful lining. And then you have the new high collar with the small lapel, and then the tiny buttons that just to make the, the you know, give the act this sort of exacting little detail. Right. Um, and then you can see in the back, one of the wonderful things about using an existing jacket, we didn't have to spend any time in getting all that wonderful back detail. The fiddle back scenes were there, the wonderful pleats and the wonderful opening in the center bend is there. So basically we save two-thirds of the time because we already have the detail there. So when it turns around, you know, people ask, how wonderful, how do you tailor that coat? It's like, well, I'm not telling I'm you my just secret. Magic. <laughs> yes. But that's the, why they pay me. <laughs> that's right. So all the, the detail work was in the front. Um, so th there you have it. That's that one. Uh, next we're going to be looking at the white frock coat. So okay, I think, and this is a design from Little Women the past, in the past fall, yes? yes? The, the version okay. we're going to see, we, don't, we have like 10 different versions, yes. but this is one, and, and this is one that we arrived to after we did many, many different changes. Okay. Um, so, so we actually opted for the simplest version. Okay. We ended, I mean, we ended up with all these fantasies, and, we did, and then we ended up with like, let's get rid of the alteration and make it really simple, Just because simple. we wanted like a modern silhouette. 
So we do each of the very basic. Mm -hmm. And again, sometimes as a designer, you make certain choices uh, because it reads right on the stage. You know, lighting, cynically, etc. You may not be able to see the detail. So you just make some choices, the choices that really helped you focus on the silhouette of the character in this case, the particular age that we wanted to make him look younger. He's supposed to be older than the main, you know, but we wanted him to look younger and fresh. He's gone through a major transformation. So the, to make a, a code that almost linked to the present, that's what mm -hmm. we're trying to do, to tell the story about this character, how he got modern, how he got younger in a way after he met Joe who's the main character. So here we see one of the main changes was adding extra buttons you know so it went from two to three uh, to redoing the, the, the roll line of the color. Um, the linen looks great on the stage and then in the back what you can see is we went from various alterations to having the open vent and um, having um, pleats. It began to look too busy and it began to look yes. a little old-fashioned so we actually closed all the vents Took in the same, gave it a, a really junior cut with that right. tight waist, which Especially is Especially for Lori. That's Just, right. Yes. So that was important. And then the white shoulder. Uh, but then for ease, we left some vent, the panel, we opened the panels on the side so the actor could, you know, have the fast movement that he needed for the scene. So it, it gives you, again, it gives you this very modern, contemporary, handsome, you right. know, um, look which is what I wanted to convey. So in this case, we made a conscious choice to forego right. of all the pure detail and just really focus on what we're talking about the character's transformation, right. what we wanted the audience to focus on. Uh, the rest of the garments in the, in the scene were completely detailed, period. So he, uh, and where he was blocked, you know, it, it worked out. Mm -hmm. So that was the idea here that we can see. And then Tyler has done a wonderful um, job in modeling this for us. <laughs> yes, um, so maybe he can go Thank back to the original red so we can talk some more about it. Okay. Um, so um, some, the other thing that we've done sometimes, we buy suits that are, they're, in the market there are suits that are extra long. Uh-huh. So you can find some, I'm always looking for sales, you know, to yes, put in my absolutely. stock. So sometimes you find extra long suits that are created for extra tall men, and you know, those are the suits you want, want to be able to create the, the frock coats. Um, it's not quite buying a suit suit, but it's really about creating the suit that you can alter. Um, now, in this case, one thing I wanted to look—I wanted you to look in the back detail—is that we, you can see the fill back, but you can see how we're giving a raise back in yes. the waist. Um, the the original actor had a little bit of a different build uh, and some muscle. Uh, and one of the things to create the illusion that this was an old jacket was by making the torso shorter on him. Okay. So it's, it's to say this is an older jacket and this guy mm -hmm. has outgrown it. So we make sure that he fit the shoulders. Okay. But then we manipulate certain areas like the waistline, etc. to say, well, he's changed, his shape's changed, just to suggest that he's outgrown it. Um, so, um, and then some of the other details here is another conversation we have. Originally, the trim was pure white with some oh. silver trim. But if you look up close, uh, the, the trim, you can see how dingy it looks moldy. Absolutely, yeah, a little and, bit uh, on the shoulder as well. Yeah, so the, the whole idea was, well, if he's really, really old and he hasn't kept it, and he's, and he's supposed to be a little mentally ill, maybe. Uh, so the question was, well, what does mold look like? How do we do this again on a body? So we just used acrylic paint. Oh. And we, you know, rubbed it on with a little cloth, and then we heat set it. Um, and then we had our kit to get the water department in case when the dry cleaning things came off. You can also use makeup and some other things. Uh, but this is, was a simple solution to age. You know, you can also, you can use all kinds of things, but you have to try them to make sure. We did some tests to see what is the thing that will last, the thing that will read right on the stage mm -hmm. yeah, uh, from the really, distance. Yeah, I can really see that it, how see it would work. See the texture works. Uh, and then all the shoulders and then like the, the side shoulders like Things like if somebody grabbed him or touched him or if the rain ran on him. So you have to make some design choices about how to distress something that also tells the and story. And telling the story, absolutely. Yeah. So that's about it. Then you can see in the back also the lining was extreme. It's a different white. And it was extremely white. So we actually ended up dipping that, which is about some rich diet, you know, and then you thin it out and then you dip it. And then we also then did the acrylic on top. Um, oh. Again, that was a quick face. It was, you know, really quickly. Uh, and for the red dyes, what we did is actually we dissolved it with a little alcohol. Okay. And then we and brushed then it on, let it dry with a, with a, you know, heat dryer. And then um, once it was dry, then we applied the acrylic. So again, you it, because you have the background and the study and the information, you're able to make choices that are effective and economical. Um, you know, in a low budget, but you had to have the background to understand how it works. So you have some more to, you know, more access mm -hmm. to technique. Um, so this is, an, again, another way of achieving that.
Great. <laughs> nice. Absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you very much, Tyler. <laughs> So, through the years, we've done all kinds of things, you know, like making knickers out of sweatpants. Oh, I haven't <laughs> heard that one, okay. You add the buttons, and then you can create fake flaps to create, like, the button detail. Mm -hmm. um, adding, um, you know, sometimes you can create a, an old, um, uh, you know, a vintage look um, of, uh, like, a, a period, you know, let's say, like, a 1800s, late 1800s long pants. You know, again, you may have a zipper, but maybe if the pants are too long, you save the so hand, easy. cut them, and then you create the flaps to create the, um, create fake buttons. Again, it's all like looking at the research very carefully and then making the choices that you can, uh, you know, again, apply, subtract, mm -hmm. hide, to make it look like those paintings from the period, because those are the things that the light will pick up in the theater. Film is not a for as forgiving. You have to be careful with your choices, uh, as long as you know what the camera is going to do. But in theater, depending on the house, you can get away with certain things and then make choices that will be cut by the light, that you can then see the detail that you need to, to have seen to convey to the audience what this character is about. Exactly. And yes, just like um, a lot of people wouldn't notice the vents and just right. from moving right. around for the actor's sake. That's right. There's always a historian in the room who will yeah, say, oh, that's course, wrong, you know? Oh, of course, I'm sure, but and I, and it's I hope the theater. They There's you know, a, you know, right. a degree of... And I ask for forgiveness always, you know. <laughs> but, you know, at the end of the day, also, I want to support the actor to do their business on the stage. You know, sometimes you have a vent here, yeah. a fall there, a pleat there, you know, right. just to make sure that they can move. Yeah. Um, and it is an actual real life, so, you right, know, they... Right, right, right. You know, and some shows you can do it because you have the budget. You know, I've worked on shows where there was enough of a budget and tailoring, you know, techniques to be able to do what we need to do. So that's pretty cool. I agree. <laughs> I agree. So, um, so I think in a nutshell, this is what we wanted to share today is all these wonderful findings. Uh, just a sample, you know, there's 20 samples or more that we could put together. Uh, this is just the beginning maybe of a series. So this is some of the key things we wanted to share for, for young designers and, and anybody who is working in a small budget uh, and then how to, you know, take mm -hmm. it to the next level by applying, you know, Do your techniques. research and reuse and yes, reuse and reuse. Yes, and reuse. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. That's really what it is about. If you are able to reuse something once, can you do it in such a way that you can repurpose it a second time? That's the idea. Uh, and a third time, and a fourth time, onto the fabric is still better than you have right. to get rid of it. Exactly. Um, so, and you've seen that in the costume show, how many times it's like, oh, we saw oh, that dress yeah. four years ago, and now it's come up again with a different trim, and we dye something, and it looks completely different, but it's the same old dress. Uh, so that's the idea of how we do these things. Um, so again, thanks to the help of this USITT grant, I was able to then reproduce things that we had used before, because that was the goal. Um, and how do we, um, you know, because my challenge was, well, how do I come up with the time and the, all of this to be able to reproduce these things that we have used and it may be in another theater stock, so it will be hard to gather, but actually do it so we can show this is the step that you take and then present it in the annual conference at USITT. And, and thanks to that grant, and then also to the being able to use the facilities at Emerson, Emerson College, College and the students who've been working, on, you know, for the last few years, we were able to do these reproductions and then show the students in action, you know, using the, the, the techniques from, from the old pros. Um, we have a comprehensive bibliography of some of the books that we use as reference, and then moving it, you know, to the next level by doing that. Uh, and we have, like, this is not the Reno jacket that we use for the production of Arcadia, by the way, the red jacket that you saw. Oh. It's really like the reproduction of it. So. Could have fooled me. It's so great. Yeah. So it's been great to be here tonight with you, Abigail. Thank you. Thank you for well. visiting with me. And I hope this show has been very informative for all of you attending to this class. <laughs> and uh, until we see you next time with some other wonderful ideas, think outside the box. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. <laughs>